Hi, welcome to the bathtub. This is Scott Bradfield, where, and this is where if you hear this music, and you see this whiteboard, and you see the words pointless and meaningless on the whiteboard, then you know that this is time for another episode of Pointless Adventures in Literature. Sometimes the adventures are pointless, sometimes they're meaningless, sometimes they're both pointless and meaningless, but they're always pointless, meaningless, or both. And that's that's the theme of our show. Um, it, we have a title, which I'll try to explain in a little bit. It sounds really, it sounds really uh, complicated, but it's not. It's called The Amazonification of WAPO. Doesn't that make no sense at all? I hope it will make sense when I'm done. Um, this is this these uh this these are the kind of episodes different. If you like just listening to someone witter on about books, this is probably not the episode for you to watch. This these are personal uh, reminiscences about publishing and my experience as a writer. They're meaning they're this one is this one is pointless. This is a pointless adventure to some extent, but it's not meaningless. And it's a bit of these are a bit roundabout and they're a bit round they're a bit uh, rambling and they um, usually never get anywhere. But uh, I still t I, t I tell these stories anyway. Um, martini with two olives in a floral patterned martini glass, just like Philip Marlowe used to drink out of. He drank out of a floral patterned martini glass. A lot of people don't know that. So um, I uh, this is a kind of a roundabout story. I, I these these round these are kind of like I said aimless stories, and I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm verging on uh, what do you call it kind of bad faith uh, discussion here today, but I do hope I'm going to be talking about something of interest to all of us, especially those of us who love books. We, we'd like to start off with the rhetorical questions. So one of the, the rhetorical questions I have this week about something very recent is a brand new book called The True Story of an American Outlaw, Butch Cassidy, by Charles Learson. I never heard, I didn't know anything about Charles Learson, but I, re, I had this book to review this uh, week for the Washington Post. I'll go into that in a little bit. And it's a fun, entertaining book, which uh, I liked. I'm going to post the review uh, down below. Um, this is my book, Why I Hate Toni Morrison's Beloved. Um, it's, it's, it's endeared me to the hearts of many people. Um, every time I publish a story or review, I, they say, what books have you published? I say, I've, I've self-published this, and they never mention it. They never, ever mention it because I think, I think they do, though they don't mention it because they might like me, actually. They think people might hate me. Um, and it also has to do with all my the, t the tons of reviews that I've written. I, I'm, a, I'm an old hack, so I have like boxes of old reviews from old newspapers all over the world, uh, from England and here and Germany, and uh, some of them are really boring, some of them are pretty good, and uh, I'm proud of most of them. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, Amazon. Amazon.com. This week, Bernie Sanders and... Um, um, a, a couple other people, um, I think Markey and uh, and the woman from New from New York who who's, who opposes uh, sexual harassment unless Joe Biden does it. I forget her name, but anyway, those three have, pro have proposed a very sensible big tax on these big creeps. I, I'm saying Jeff Bezos and Walmart and all these big creeps, and and who make billions and billions of dollars and are just creeps. That's, I'm going to put it right that simple. Um, and I want to start by talking about how you know these people are making huge amounts of money. And my personal shame, I have a certain shameful story uh, to tell. I need a little sip of my, my drink to tell this story because I am a little embarrassed about it. Because I'm actually really personally responsible to, for some of the profits from people, places like Walmart where I used to shop. You know, I actually shopped there. We first moved in here. I knew I shouldn't. But four years ago, I, I, I've tried not to shop at Walmart. We went and bought a bunch of kitchen stuff because we were so broke when we moved and we went and bought that stuff there and uh amazon i i'm totally i would have been totally seduced by amazon i've been totally i'm their toy boy i just feel totally ashamed of my history with amazon when they first started um someone told me about it, being a lover of books and i was one of the first people that started ordering books from amazon totally loved that they were 20 30 percent off um i i i'm not really going for a little bit about how much i liked amazon for so long I um, I would buy books from them, and and as they as they got better, and they got they started giving you more and more offers. I'd say, oh yeah, please, I'll take that offer, I'll take that offer, and I would do whatever. I get that credit card. I had a credit. I've had a credit card with Amazon for decades, um, and uh, I buy stuff from them, and then they start selling other stuff, you know, printer ribbons, and I you know crap. I was buying everything from them. 
Um, they're, not, they're like an octopus. So they basically get totally took over my whole life. So I bought lots of books from them. And I'll also say, I wanted to say some of the things I liked about Amazon because I liked many things about them. Uh, one was, I'm a writer. I'm a selfish writer. And we're all kind of scabs. Writers are basically, we're scabs. I try, I try, I really respect unions, but we're, we basically live on our own. We're, we're separate from the whole world. We have no connection to the world. And we just try to write our books and get them published. And I always had one kind of overriding concern. This is embarrassing, but it's true. When I looked at bookstores, people always said, you should buy from independent bookshops. And I said, yeah, you should. But every time I went into an independent bookshop, they never had my books. I mean, I can think of one or two independent bookshops in my life. I went into it and said, oh, they had my books. And I was so thrilled. But most of them never had it. They had all the same. They had like all the, you know, they had the latest um, uh, Toni Morrison books. And they had all the John Grisham books and the Stephen King books. They didn't have any of my books. And they were, they, they didn't have, and I just personally would not like them then. Amazon always had my books for sale. They were, I said, great. People could buy, it was the only place in America anyone could buy one of my books. Total, I'm, a, I'm a whore. I said, yeah, I like Amazon. They sell my books. Um, they went on to, uh, what are the other things I started to love? Okay, so then they made it really easy. They came up with this brilliant software that even an idiot like me could self-publish his books. So I self-published this total vanity book, which is some of, some of the essays I liked best about writing reviews over 40 years. And I've published this. I also published my, uh, I should sh put it up here because it's like my favorite book in some ways. I also published my uh, last fi book of fiction, which is my Dazzle Resplendent, which is actually dedicated to Bernie Sanders and to uh, Ralph Nader. So you'll really hate that. But that, that was dedicated to them. I published it myself. And the stories have been published elsewhere, but I, I could do it. Even an idiot. Amazon had created this system, which was brilliant. So I could put my books on there. I took took all of my old books. I put them on ebooks. Great. Okay. That, that was, that, I did them on ebooks. Took a little while, but you know they're not like selling. They're not flying off the shelves, as they say. But they're available, and all a writer really cares about is they're available. I love that. Prime Video came along, bang! I bought it. Got free shipping. I was on Prime Video. Um, every time I quit, they'd send me something for free, and I say, okay, I'll go back to. The, I was back on fucking Amazon. So anyway, I bought from Amazon for years. I could send presents through Amazon really easily. I sent my nieces and nephews. I would send them gift certificates. I sent all my books. They would tell you when it's your nephew's birthday. I don't know when my nephew's and niece's birthdays are. I have the faintest idea. Amazon does. They tell me I sent them. I sent books on the... I'm like the only person in our family who probably usually gets the presents to the nieces and nephews on time. Amazon does it for me. Okay, this long, it goes on and on. Um, there's too much, too many reasons why I've, I've liked Amazon. Um, now, I, I want on, on the on the other side of this long rambling story is my reviewing career. So for, for decades, I've written book reviews. And I, I like book reviews and some longer essays. The longer essays are really hard, I find, but I'm, I like the Toni Morrison essay in here. Um, they're kind of personal essays, and I'm proud of those too, but they're much harder to write. I started writing reviews for the same reason I got seduced by Amazon, because I like books. There's no other reason I really did it. And I get free books. And I like reviewing, but they're really it's a really hard profession. It's very hard to write a book review. I still have no idea how you write a book review. It's really fucking hard. That's all I can tell you. So I wrote reviews, particularly when I lived in London in England. I moved there in the mid-80s, and I couldn't work. I couldn't get a job because I didn't have a green card or any of that stuff, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I was writing my fiction, and I found that some places hired me to review books. I don't know why. I was terrible. I wrote terrible book reviews for at least that first year or two. They were all pretty bad, and I didn't know what I was doing. But they paid me, and I, and I could actually pay afford to go to the pub and, and work in my uh, and, and read the books they assigned me and uh, write my stuff. I published in all sorts of places. And over the years, I think I did slowly start to get good at it. I actually became a fairly decent reviewer, though it was never easy. Writing a book review has never been easy for me. I've probably written 300 or more book reviews and essays over 40 years. At least 300. I'm just taking a wild guess. But about 300. Um, most, every one of them was, was difficult. 
Most all of them were pretty good by the time I was finished. Occasionally I would turn in some pretty crappy copy. It was a bit of a mess. And on very rare occasion, they didn't run it. I can only think of four or five times when people, when I turn in copy that no one published, and a few, and, and twice as many times when they said, well, you know, this is a bit of a mess. You've got to do some work here or there. And I'd go back and do the work. And then there was always the normal give and take where they would send the stuff back to you and say, oh, do this and do that. You'd send it back and you'd fiddle with it. And I would say that 95% of my experience with 30 different I must have worked with at least 30 or 40 different review editors from Germany, England, America. Um, did I do anything else? Well, I think those are the only countries. We're all basically useful. I, I only remember maybe two or three editors who really never gave me a good... They never really helped. They never made it worse, but they didn't really help. But most of the review editors were pretty good. Okay, so... That's been that's my review. Edit. I've written all these different types of books and reviews, but I basically I took it seriously, and I've always tried to do a pretty good job. Um, this is the uh, this is the intersection of this totally rambling story. I uh, over the past uh, year or so, I worked with a great editor at the Washington Post Book World. Now, the Washington Post Book World is kind of the more fun. It's it's the New York Times. I've worked for them for years. They're great, really serious, responsible. They copy it you almost to you can't breathe anymore. But they always check all the facts and everything. Washington Post is a little easier going. They do a lot more kind of fun stuff, a lot more genre stuff. They're a little you can play around a little bit more there. I I found. I haven't worked for them much, but it's a good paper. It's a good page. The Washington Post has been pretty good for a long time. I worked with a great editor there named Stephanie Mary. I only I did four or five pieces for her. She was great. Really helpful. Had a really light touch, but really helped you when she suggested things. And she also, more importantly, let me do fun books. So we did Stanislaw Lem, and I can't remember what else. Um, between Stephanie and with the LA Times, I've done a lot with the LA Times for about four or five years. I had four editors in four years of the LA Times. That They just got, they, you don't even, can't, you, they're just like a revolving door over there. I really had great experience. Totally different editors. Every one of them was different. My, the first one, Carolyn, um, oh, I can't always forget Carolyn's last name, but I'll remember it out later. Uh, she was there when I first started, and she let me do these great pieces, and Drew came along, and now uh, Boris is there, and he's really been helpful. with. Uh, he's got a, a little more st structured approach to reviews, but he's very useful. All very helpful people, and always would call me out if I made a mistake or help me with help me find my way if I wasn't doing the perfect job. Okay, so, and a really great experience. Lots of other places I've worked for. Uh, hundreds of reviews. Um, I make a mistake. I, I, I was looking around. I, I found a Bush book. I saw, I saw this book about uh, Butch Cassidy, and I thought, this is the kind of stuff I like to review. Something odd, a little different, uh, a history of some cowboy. I like, I like cowboy and cowboy outlaw stuff. I used to do a lot for the Times Educational Supplement and TLS, and they used to send me stuff like this all the time, and I loved it. So I called a guy. I I, I wrote the e I emailed the guy who does nonfiction at the Washington Post, and he said, "Okay, sure. Why don't you do?" It? He looked at the book, and you know, I gave him my resume, blah blah blah. I said, "Sure, fine. He sounds fine. You go ahead and do it." So we go through this long thing. It goes on for it goes on for a couple of months because the pandemic's going on. This book, it's kind of we can't even get the hard copy, and we're, I'm constantly writing and saying I'm having trouble getting this or that, and I'm trying to read the book on Eve copies, which is hard. It's hard to review that way. We go through this for quite a while, and uh, eventually I get this stuff done. I finish it. I turn it in about uh, about six weeks ago now, five weeks ago, and um, the guys note understandably busy. Everybody in the pub, in book publishing right now is totally swamped because the pandemic has screwed up all the publishing schedules. The newspapers are all pulling back. Newspapers don't even want to do book reviews anyway. I'll tell you the secret. They, don't, they just don't care about their book sections. They're all pulling these book their pages, and then there's lots of important books about how you know, basically our planet is burning up, and those are pretty important, so those are filling the spaces up. Okay, I don't hear from the guy for a month, and I'm going to tell this whole personal story here. I don't hear from the guy for a month, and I write him what I often do when I haven't heard from my editor for a month, especially a new one, I don't know. And I said, you know, I hope that piece doesn't suck. It's been a kind of crazy few weeks, and, and maybe I wasn't thinking right, but if there's any problem with it, just let me know. He, he writes me back, says, don't worry about it. Goes on another few days. Finally, in the morning, 
uh, about last week. He sends me like three sentences. He says, this is substandard work. I don't have time to edit it. I'm too busy. I can't, I don't have the time to go back and forth on editing this piece. Uh, on a side note here, going back and forth with the writer you commissioned is the editor's job. Uh, just so you know, that is what editors do. He says, it's too big of a mess. It's just, I can't, I can't. It's, and then I write him back. I'm a little annoyed. And I say, well, you know, this is not really the way to do it. You, you, you sit on it for a month and you send it back to me. It's too late for me to sell this anywhere. He says, I'll give you 50 bucks kill fee. Now, he says, $50. This is the Washington Post owned by Jeff Bezos. $50. Now, for those who aren't journalists or have done it, a kill fee is what a publisher does when they're not going to run your piece. It, it's, it's, I, all my life, it's always been standard, was half price. So Washington Post usually pays me three seventy five. Normally they would say, okay, the kill fee, I'll give you 180 or something like that. In 40 years of reviewing, I have only once received, a, someone only once gave me a kill fee for a piece they didn't publish. They gave me half price. It was Esquire, like English Esquire or something. I don't even, this was 30 years ago. I don't even know what, why that was. No review editor has ever not for, has said, I'm not paying you because I don't like your work. You didn't turn in good work. Never, no one's ever said this to me before. I, I've had a couple people who said didn't like what I did or something like that. I'm not saying that, but they, no one said, I'm not going to pay you. Screw you, 50 bucks. Never, he said, I've never heard of this before. So um, the, even the times people didn't run, I've worked for Rupert Murdoch's papers. I've worked for the Evening Standard. I'm trying to remember. I've worked for you know places that are owned by big monsters. I mean, Rupert Murdoch is probably the worst of the whole group. The editors I worked with at Rupert Murdoch's New Times Magazine. I worked for the New York Times, uh, not the New York Times, the London Times. No problem. They never cut a piece of. They never cut a piece without telling me and agreeing it with me, and they always paid me full fee. Once a few times in my life, I can remember someone didn't run it. They couldn't fit it in or whatever. Maybe they hated it. I don't know. And they paid me the full fee. No one's ever chiseled me with 50 bucks until this guy, this character at the Washington Post. Okay, so I don't know if you, uh, I'm, I have one little, I have one little uh, secret piece of information. I'm, as an old man, I don't have much advice. But for many years, I learned 20 years ago from my friend Oliver Syriax that when somebody does something really horrible, they're usually supported by a whole system. And there's almost never a complaint procedure. So when someone can say, I'm throwing 50 bucks at you, go away, take your piece and, and stick it, that's because they probably don't have a sensible complaint procedure for freelancers to go through. So I, the first thing I did was write a complaint to his boss. At this point, you know you're not going to get, there's no complaint procedure because this guy wouldn't get away with this nonsense. I sent it to his boss. His boss comes back to me and says, yeah, 50 bucks isn't very much, is it? We pay a really bad kill fee. And I do it once or twice a week. This is, his, this is the editor of this big section of this paper at the Washington Post. Once or twice a week. Freelance writers, work hard. You spend weeks and weeks on a piece. You turn it in. I going to give you 50 bucks. Piss off. Okay, so normally I would run this, entertain, this, this uh, complaint procedure up the ladder and, and try, to sh try to institute some sense, sense on the Washington Post part that when they commission people, they should give them a good, fairly clear reason why they don't like a piece, not just say, it's substandard, go away. They should explain, they should also give that writer a chance to fix the piece if there's, some, if there's something wrong with it. I've never, ever refused to turn, try to rework a piece that needs work. And do these things. There should be some sort of established procedures. The Washington Post doesn't do it because they just don't have to. Okay. The Washington Post has a union. I've, I've looked into this the past week or two. And all the regular journalists there, the full-time people, are part of a union. It's a pretty good union. And they, sh they should have that union because Bezos is a bastard. He's a complete creep. And so they're going to have to take care of themselves. But what the Washington Post has done, has, uh, everyone does, most people do freelancing, get freelancers to do book reviews. I like, you know, um, and they started something called Talent Network. I'm reading from the press release now from their page. And this, the Post describes it as, it is a digital platform that Washington Post editors use to assign freelancers and that freelancers use to pitch stories. 
Our aim is to open up the newsroom to more ideas for news coverage from across the country and the world and to more easily locate the best freelance talent when breaking news occurs outside Washington. So this is a new, I looked a little bit into this. I haven't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, I'll tell you. But it seems like the Washington Post has instituted this, this new online system for attracting freelancers, who they have anyway. I mean, I was already working for them. I didn't go through this. And bringing them into the Washington Post. And then there's no, they have no responsibilities when they commission them. They'll, maybe they'll send them 50 bucks. They can spend four or five weeks. They don't mention that anywhere on the webpage. The, the, this, they, they, I got some information from these two editors about how they really think about their commissioning, their responsibilities to commission, right, commissioning writers, but they don't say anything on the page. What it does is undercuts the strength of the full-time journalists at the Washington Post. Most of us freelancers, to some extent, are scabs. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not proud of that, but I'm not apologetic either. No, no one at the, pre, the, the people at the WAPA don't want to write book reviews all day. I like writing them. <laughs> so you're basically a scab. What they're trying to do now is they're trying to obviously open up Washington Post and bring in more of these freelance writers, and then they have no responsibilities to them. They can treat them contemptuously, which is the way I was treated, and, this, and then throw 50 bucks, if that. Okay, so I wanted to just kind of end this. This, is a long, this has gone too long, probably too long for my talks and say that I don't think that my stupidity at being an Amazon uh, seductee is unrelated. I honestly feel like I screwed myself to some extent. I supported this idiot Bezos. I made, I helped, I sent him, I just free, I must have sent hundreds of dollars to Amazon every month, one way or another, through mail order stuff and gifts and Prime. About a year ago, I, I've been really cutting back. I stopped sending presents through Amazon. I cut my Prime subscription. I just ended my Prime subscription. I still, on rare occasions, buy something from them. I still have my books up there. I, there's nowhere else I can put them. I put them. They're still there, and that's the only place people can buy them unless they buy them from me. Um, and I still have my Kindle. I like I like my Kindle. I like buying. I, I liked buying books on Kindle, and I still occasionally buy a really cheap book on the Kindle Daily Deal. I'm trying not to do that anymore. My personal feeling is that uh, Amazon and Jeff Bezos and the ty those types of people are destroying everything we love, especially books. They want to take over, they want to, take, they want to turn the Washington Post into a huge generator of commission pieces and screw over, just like Uber drivers. I've never, I felt exactly like an Uber driver when I dealt with these clowns at the Washington Post. Um, and they want to just, they just want, he wants to do everything. He wants to push up every nickel he can get into his pocket, like all these other big shot billionaires. They just don't care about the people who work for them at all. And I'm really just fed up. I feel like we've been all screwing the pooch. Do you know that expression? We're all screwing the pooch. And I feel like I've been screwing the pooch. No, please, please don't look at Lucky when I say that. Um, there's something about it that we've just kind of let it go on too long. Now I'm not gonna, I'm not perfect. I'm not going to do the greatest job of trying to just. I'm going to try to cut myself loose from this monstrosity that I buy books from. I there's a new bookshop that does independent bookstores. I'm trying to buy through independent bookstores as much as I can. Buy as as if I can anything I cannot eat buy from. I stopped going to to that stupid grocery store he bought, and you know as much as I hate to say it, the Washington Post was a really great paper for a long time. I have, I, I canceled my subscription to that. You know, this is not just one editor treating one person like crap. That's why I really wanted to do this talk. It is a sign that this evil approach to to people who work is is just got to end. And I'm I'm fed up with it. I had my career. I had a good career. I like my I like my life. I'm happy where I am. But I look at young people coming along. They're going to work for these idiots. Some young freelancer is going to work for that idiot. And they're going to give him 50 bucks and tell him his stuff's substandard when this guy clearly doesn't have any idea what he's doing. Um, no, I don't think that should happen. So I would like to say one last thing. Uh, is it Margaret Sullivan works at the Washington Post? And she's kind of a good, you know, she's a good journalist. She's been on the, on the news a lot lately about her book, about what's happened in the newspapers. And I, I, coincidentally, while this was happening, I heard her on, you know, Fresh Air or something talking about her book. And she was saying that, you know, the Bezos buying the Washington Post has not affected the editorial policy at the Washington Post. And uh, Margaret, that's not true. 
the way I was treated, that no, I've never, Rupert Murdoch's papers did not ever treat me that way. That, and they're treating that, and from what I understand, they're treating a lot of people, one or two people a week in this one section, that's what he says, and how many hundreds of pieces they're publishing a, a year from freelancers. They're clearly after you guys. They're after the, they're after the union, jo uh, union jobs. That's what they're after. So I, I wouldn't say that. And uh, yeah, I'm sure he's asset stripping and selling the old building and putting everybody in like particle board cubicles and cardboard boxes. But at the same time, uh, you know, I don't know what goes on there, and I don't, I don't really, I'm not going to worry too much about it. So that's all I have to say. I think that covered everything I wanted to talk about. Um, at the end of the day, this is a fun book. I'm going to post my substandard review somehow with this piece. I'll connect it with you somehow so you can read the substandard review. It's nothing great. It was just trying to make a few jokes, make a light piece for the, the page that was probably filled with stuff about the, the planet burning down, and do something you could mention the old Paul Newman movie, which I love. So it was a very light piece, and it probably is it's far from perfect, but if it, wasn't, if it needed to work, the editor's job is to tell you what to do. Uh, that, that's their job. And um, um, you can read these books self-published. Um, if you don't want to buy them from Amazon, go to, go to uh, Skylight Books in L.A., or go through this online bookshop. I'll put a link to down below. Sorry this went too long, um, but it, I did want to make sure it was pointless and meaningless, and I didn't want to leave any of that out. Happy bathing. Stay away from Jeff. Stay away. Cut your cut your links. We've got to cut this octopus out of our lives. It is everywhere. Get Amazon out of your life. We got to de Amazonify ourselves. Take care. Happy bathing.